So hello to everybody and thanks for coming. I will talk basically about my childhood growing up in a Bauhaus house and how I get out or escaped from it with the help of Robert Venturi's highly important book, Learning from Las Vegas. It was a revolutionary book in architectural theory around 68. This book and Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, also written by Venturi, could be seen as one of the first theories about postmodern thinking regarding cities and buildings. <clears throat> These two books could also be seen as iconoclash gesture against form follows function, which was in the first half of the century a nearly not breakable dogma. Venturi was bringing suddenly new arguments up. One of the key arguments was to underline the pictographic aspect of a building and looking at everyday architecture in a new way. Before that, suburbia was extremely bad valuated. A famous example for this kind of critique on suburbia was Peter Black's book, which was not the painter, the English painter, with a wonderful title, it's called Devil's Own Junkyard. Venturi went, inspired by Edrusha's genius photo book, Every Building on Sunset Strip, and being aware of the British as found movement, with his wife, Dennis Scott Brown, and his students to Las Vegas, where they made a lot of pictures and started to look and think in a radical new and fresh way about suburbia and the so-called trivial architecture in the special case of Las Vegas, an architecture that was mainly made for creating a spectacle for the consumer. Five years ago, a friend of mine discovered Venturi's photo archive with more than 2,000 slides from that time and asked me if I would be interested in helping him to make a show and a book with this material. The show started in Switzerland and traveled around and went also to Yale University, where they did a symposium about Venturi and Scott Brown. So when I was invited to have a speech about learning from Las Vegas, I was a little bit confused since I'm not used to give speeches at all. On the other hand, I was aware that speaking at Yale University, I will have an audience of experts in postmodernism in art and architecture. So I needed an idea how I can sneak out of the danger that I imitate to be an expert. The last time I was forced to give a speech, it was at school. <clears throat> it was about Thor Heyerdahl and his self-made Kontiki raft. That's the conti famous Kontiki raft. This speech, that I had as a young, young teenager in front of other teenager, which was basically regarding the topic of escapism, hold in this jail that was called the school was a big success. So I thought I just could repeat it. Uh, I learned that's normally what artists are doing when they realize that something is a success. So I learned from genius art historian Stanislaus von Moos, using the method of pastiche and collage, that a connection can always be made later. But then I changed my plan. While keeping the idea of a journey, my journey from Dessau to Las Vegas. <coughs> On my journey, I will take some super simplifying shortcuts and some unloss, un useless de detours. Sorry for that in advance. So I grew up in a household shaped by the ha Bauhaus and the thinking behind it. My father, Hans Fischli, an architect and artist, 
studied in Dessau for a while. Upon his return in Switzerland in 1930, he immediately built the house near Zurich where I grew up. That's the house. I was born in 1952. That house bore the stamp of my father's Bauhaus days and still in the 50s, it stood out as a rather unusual thing. At that time, the village of Meilen was still a farming community placed in the normality of Swiss life. As a child, you want to be as much as everyone else as possible, and it only slowly dawns on you that you're living in a different kind of house compared to the other children. This is the back side of the house. But even if some of them mocked our shoebox, which was his nickname, we soon began to realize it was something quite special. People used to come from all over to see it. So we began to feel a certain pride, which no doubt helped us to deal with the fact that we had no, no normal furniture. We had we had no sofa. What we did have, we were chairs by Bertoia and Breuer. Of course, not upholstered, which my father would call bourgeois. I also became aware of the way he used to teach his clients on the matter of right and wrong. By just hypnotizing them, he lectured them on the fact that the Bauhaus is not a style, but a state of mind, a thought. That style is the first step in the direction of kitsch, because it's only about surface and form and mostly has nothing to do with the spiritual or intellectual content. He didn't judge taste according to form, but on a preserving level, using the same criteria by which we judge life or society. We absorbed this teaching as children. But it wasn't a case of bashing the wrong. It was always about a passion for the right. That this leads to certain interesting moment at home. He didn't want any schnickschnack in the house. And I remember arguments because he didn't like flowers or potted plants, since for him, Nature happened outside. When we were given souvenirs from distant lands, he would see that they discreetly disappeared. It was a little bit like living with the taste police. <laughs> I was only later that I pieced together and added some questions marked to the background on this. This image I found when I googled Bertoia, not upholstered. <laughs> <laughs> the outside world always looked at us with a mixture of admiration and mild scorn. My father had a special relationship to things, to architecture, to furniture, and to pictures in the house. There was an Albus painting, a clay drawing in the living room. Everything was charged with his big enthusiasm he gained in the Bauhaus. He was so convinced and inspired by the rightness of the Bauhaus that it dropped off on us in a way. I remember also a story which shows that he was deeply convinced of modernism. One day, somebody called up and wanted to convince him that an old, famous Liberty-style café in Zurich, the Café Odeon, a landmark, should be renovated. I remember how he shouted in the phone, tear it down, tear it down, build something new. <laughs> so that was the spirit. <laughs> in the mid-60s, when I was 15, I discovered pop art, an art with a love for everyday things of the present. It was that moment when the project of modernism was transformed into something else. 
The key point of modernism was the idea of utopia. After World War II, modernism was entering and being accepted in a larger frame of society. To this transformation, the radical idea of modernism, utopia, was getting in danger and lost his power by losing his radical statement. By losing the focus in the future, a room was created to look at the present. This made pop possible. Later on, the hippies played around with the idea of utopia. But for me, I was always skeptical about it. I thought it was something just like the after pain, the nachwehen of utopia. But this is another story. Back to pop. The so-called banal and trivial of the now, the now of the 60s. That was new for me. A big new field opened up. Everything in it was very, very familiar, but it was the first time that I saw artists working like this. One started from learning from Las Vegas. The beat of the 60s influenced my new attitude to life. To life. As I learned from Dennis Scott Brown, pop art was invented in England. Here's an example, a print of Richard Hamilton with the title, A Dedicated Follower of Fashion, which is a song of a brilliant band called The Kings. I always wondered what the person on the phone on the other side is saying, but maybe he's just a gallerist inviting somebody to Richard Hamilton's opening party. My first personal encounter with a Las Vegas kind of thing was years before, when I was still a child. They held yearly fun fairs in the village of Milan, in the countryside. They were called Gilbis. This is an image of it. For three days, they assembled ghost rides, roller coasters, all kinds of carousels, wonderful and super colorful things with light bulbs going on and off. Wow, it was exciting. Everything there stood in a strong contrast to what I was normally surrounded with. And there were also some more images. And there were also the Halbstarken, literally translated as the Halfstrongs, a Swiss version of the rock and roll rebel. A kind of prototype of a new rebellious youth. They were the queens and kings of the funfair world. They were not really political, only in the sense of denying a normal way of life and behavior. And that's already a lot. That's another image. <laughs> uh, years, years later, as an artist, I was still very interested in that field. Out of it came a work called Photographias. It is a selection of found, painted, or airbrushed images, mostly taken on, on fun fairs, we took underexposed black and white photographs and presented them as small postcard-sized pictures. So the trick was simple. Something that was big and colorful was turned into something black and white and rather small and delicate. After years of taking pictures of airports, houses, landscapes, flowers, I realized that with photography you always bump on the wall of the visible. There is no way of going behind that wall. Using the trick of taking images of painted things, most of them about dreams and fears, we found a sort of a fake hole in the wall of the visible. But maybe it was only a painted hole. The funfair world is very much into being upside down. Most of the rights are about disorientation of mind and body. 
Their target is to make you shaky, to make you kind of seasick without getting on a boat, to take the ground away from under your feet. I guess the sunken ship is an example for angstlust, literally translated as fear pleasure, is also one of their main topics. Imagine the boat in the wild storm, and this is what the most rides provoke, suddenly is sinking. Big fun, big fear. This is again about angstlust, but this time on, the, on a children's fairy tale level. So you see it as a real training camp for dealing with dreams and nightmares. Their intention is to make you forget that you are here and now is very important. And for provoke that, they even take things from high culture, like Venice Rialto Bridge, where tourism is able to create the perfect mix of high and low. Maybe one of the biggest nightmares I can imagine is to be on a gondola on Canale Grande and having listened to a horrible singing gondoliere. But I guess they mean it the other way around. After Professor Fonmo's lecture compared Venice with Las Vegas, somebody in the audience came up with a very interesting question about the difference between archetypes and stereotypes. In the iconography of photographias, these two fields are often overlapping and mix it in a nice way. It's part of their attraction. It's, it's part that it's an unsolved problem. This is too early. In Dostoevsky's book, The Idiot, where the first, the idiot, is mentally confused and sent to Switzerland for healing, one day in the streets of Basel, he sees a donkey. And by only looking at this wonderful animal, he suddenly healed. I had a similar experience when I saw the book Learning from Las Vegas for the first time. What the donkey to the, did to the idiot, this book did to me. But something was different. I was not sick and the donkey was a dog. A dog that successfully escaped from God's own junkyard. There was a moment of sudden agreement. This image is a key point in Venturi's book. He describes two types of houses which are typical for Vegas. First, first the type of the dog type house. All houses creating a strong image or are very pictographic. The second type is the decorated shed. This building in the shape of a dock was familiar to me in a twisted way since I grew up in a shoebox. As I mentioned before, this was the nickname of my father's house, the Bauhaus house. It was never meant to be a dock by the vernacular, by the Volksmund, turned into something pictographic. People wanted to see an image in it. The people from the village saw the image of that shoebox. So when the donkey transforms himself into a dock and the dock transforms in a shoebox, it starts to get confusing. But sometimes, as a contradiction, confusion helps to understand things better. This is a slightly uncanny example of confusion of signs and unclear references. As we see, signs can leave their original meaning. They travel and find a new home. It is hard to tell if they are ignorance or fashion victims imitating English punks or fake Japanese neo-Nazis. There is something frightening, grotesque, and postmodern in it. This weird, unclear connection between science and references is something that we had to learn to deal with it. It is already 
one step forward in the direction of post nothing. Another image that I found in the field of today's pop culture. It's the name of a band and a, a pop album. I am still working out what that expression means, but it sounds great. It sounds like we could say you can fill it with, let's say, nothing. Mostly, when you say nothing, you talk unexpressed about all the things you want to exclude. There is a wonderful text, it's more a list from Ed Reinhardt, where he names all the things he doesn't want to paint. So in a strange way, when I look at his wonderful monochrome empty paintings, all these, these things cross my mind. This maybe describes post nothing. So maybe that term comes from an overdose of references in a collapse of too many connections. Now I will talk about some of the images that uh, the Venturis and the students took in, in Las Vegas. What I found interesting in this image is the viewpoint of the photographer. He looks over the shoulder of the Roman soldier as if he would like to show what the soldier is seeing. So this is like looking from history in form of a Roman soldier to the present, the present in the form of a parking lot in Las Vegas. Or you could say the Roman is looking into the future, which is our present. I have the feeling to see the present clear and being in, in the present is really difficult. The present is our black spot. To see history in form of a parking lot in Las Vegas in the 60s now is much easier. Even imagine the future is easier. Because of the missing distance to the present, it often creates this so-called blind spot. What we see in this image is Dennis Scott Brown and Robert Venturi looking at the present by being in it at the same time. This is what it makes it so outstanding, that they saw the present without fear, clear, visionary, generous, without being cynical in their interpretation of it. There is a nice contradiction in this situation. Venturi and Scott Brown, as postmodernist, acted like modernists. The modernist who only wanted to look at the now, and Ikeno clashed the old and the past. But as an irony, the new in Las Vegas was a fake old, or the authentic was the non-authentic, and became to a sneaking in to a back door, the new authentic. When I look at this image, I doubt it was always easy to see these things in a relaxed and generous way. To look at Vegas in the 60s without judging and imitate, imitate, imitate it as a capitalistic and prof, profit-oriented thing was a risky point of the view of Venturi and Tony Dennis Scott Brown. Remember, this city looked like a nightmare for the situationists. I imagine that Vegas, for them, was the peak of an architecture de la société du spectacle. What the situationist would like about Vegas is the fact that you can get money without working. Remember Guy Debord's graffiti from 58 in Paris called Ne travaillez jamais. This Stardust building looks like a strange airport for extraterrestrials to me. The globe on top of it should make clear to them on which planet they have landed. And the word Stardust makes it clear that besides the stars, there is a lot of dust in Vegas. A city that itself resembles a spaceship, 
placed in the dry desert of Nevada to arrive in Vegas after driving for days to an empty and dry landscape. Some of them are even called devil's own golf course. This gives the city a different frame of experiencing it. The lady in the middle of the image, who rather unusually arrives by foot, exposed to the dry heat, the dust, and the bright light, like Simon del Deserto in Binuel's film, stands for me for this feeling. This is another image that I would like to overinterpret. For me, this situation, Dennis Scott Brown with the camera looking in the mirror was something very Dan Graham avant la lettre. It's like a vision of a Dan Graham work. One of the key points in Graham's mirror pieces is the spectator watching himself looking at his image. This makes us thinking on Lacan's writing where he describes the mirror stage. Very simply said, the mirror stage is the situation when a baby in the age between one and two years for the first time recognizes his image and the self in the mirror. This image is very important to build up, to build up a sense for the self-identity. Another important aspect is that the child sees his body for the first time as a whole. Before that, the baby sees his body only in fragments or deconstructed and distort. I found it a nice coincidence that deconstruction, fragmentation, and distortion are all ca characteristic elements of postmodern aesthetical language. On the other hand, I can say that Dan Graham's pavilions and mirror camera performance made me better understand how to look, for example, at the Barcelona Pavilion. I stopped looking at the building and concentrated on the overlapping semi-reflection and the reflection on the people looking at their own reflection mixed with fragments of the building. It became imm immaterial, nearly psychedelic. So you see, a polyester Roman figure can help me to understand a parking lot in Las Vegas, and then Dan Graham helped me to understand, or even better, to see the Barcelona pavillon outside of a cliché. Now, this is getting delicate. I'm starting more and more working on thin ice. There was a time, long time ago, when there was something like kitsch. Somebody, everybody, not somebody, everybody talked about high and low. There were art critics and so on. I imagine it was a nice time because we believed kitsch and high culture were clearly divided. As the Swiss art historian Beat Wies pointed out correctly, the invention of high and low was a phantom discussion that was mainly created to build up enemies, Feindbilder. Also, in Pope Clement's famous essay, Avant-garde and Kitsch, we can see the arguments about high and low in that time were mostly criticizing the capitalistic system, creating easy to consume things instead of educating the masses to having access to high culture. It's easy to find proofs of high culture or high art in high art that focuses on the everyday, the trivial, the so-called low was a topic in art long time before pop. So the new thing about pop was not only his contents, it was mostly his appearance. What shows us again something very well known about art. It's more important how an artist is doing something than sometimes what an artist is doing. 
The new viewpoint in the Las Vegas discovering years helped us to see complexity and contradiction of the term kitsch. Later, kitsch learned to travel and was looking for new homes, new territory. And as a surprise, sometimes I have the feeling that the kitsch of today di discovered the so-called good taste. And therefore, we can ask us, is good taste something very different from beauty? Beauty is always taking a risk to something uncertain. There is often an unsolved problem in it, and good taste is really afraid of that. Popular good taste mostly wants to be on the secure side. Beside that, we learned from Bourdieu and Veblen these questions has as much to do with sociology than with aesthetics. Now we go to the... What I like in this image is the atmosphere of self-confidence, the open-hearted, direct attitude with the present. All this can be seen very clearly in the body language of Dennis Scott Brown, which I would describe as with legs and feet on the ground like Clint Eastwood in a cowboy movie, and her hands in her hips like Sofia Loren in an Italian Novo Realismo movie from the 50s. She stands in the middle of a present that is half a ruin in form of that fake chimney, that fireplace, and half in an upcoming new world in form of Las Vegas. <clears throat> On my way back from Yale to Zurich, I stopped in New York and saw the Bauhaus show at the MoMA. One thing in the show made me really think, what is this? This image could also be seen as pop art. It was created by Herbert Bayer in 28. As we see, what a surprise. If I would like to provoke art historians and bring myself in a lack of evidence, one could also say pop art was invented at the Bauhaus. It's a pre-Oldenburg and it's a pre doc in one. So in the end, I may be learned in Las Vegas to see the complexity and the contradiction of the Bauhaus. Thank you. Would you like to ask questions? Yeah, Peter, it's so, so exciting. And one thing which I was actually wondering is um, we were discussing yesterday with Alice Rathorn, the, the Bauhaus, and she was thinking, you know, about Switzerland, and then we discussed Max Bill, and obviously the Bauhaus kind of continued in, in Ulm. And one of the things, um, uh, I was very curious if you could tell us a little bit about the connection to Max Bill, because I know that you included a Max Bill sculpture in the Börse, in the... Uh, stock exchange in Zurich, which is still there, and I was just curious uh, about the sort of connection to Max Bill. Well, um, I would say there was, uh, for me, um, when I started to be interested in art with, without being forced by my parents to look at art, uh, I had already an overdose of Max Bill uh, and he had, he had also an incredibly, he, he was like the, um, uh, the big artist in Zurich at that time. So we had a um, kind of counter-reaction. And I remember um, one day I went to the movie theater to see uh, Yellow Submarine, the Beatles movie. And Max Bill was in the movie theater. And then I thought, what an asshole he is. <laughs> what, he sneaks in and ah, he wants to pick up. <laughs> uh, 
but today uh, I'm much more relaxed and uh, <laughs> and um, I, I really like a lot of his works, uh, especially the works they were uh, uh, in that time uh, people hated it, uh, like the the golden things he's do, like these these things they were kind of uh, n uh, not so strict and kind of too decorative. And uh, I, uh, these pieces I really like a lot. <laughs> yeah, and there is a question from Alice. Alice was actually wondering, she has the Bauhaus question about who is the favorite kind of Bauhaus artist or architect. So she wanted to ask you, uh, and also you, you've seen the show obviously at uh, MoMA and here, who was your favorite Bauhaus person? Mm, that's difficult to say. They, um, um, I can't really say that the, the whole thing for me, as I said in the end of the speech, uh, the, the more time goes on, I really see a, a lot of undiscovered... I, I had a kind of a cliché idea what the Bauhaus is when I was a, a teenager. And more and more, I just uh, see how how playful the whole thing was, and yeah, the, the complexity of it is uh, is that so the many different figures, and that you can see certain things that that leads they are like really like pre pre uh, uh, pop as Herbert Bayer, but also as pre-conceptual art. So I don't come up with a favorite. <laughs> I should say my father, maybe he can hear it. <laughs> I have a brief question about your father, which is how did he apply to the Bauhaus? Hmm? How did your father apply to the Bauhaus? How? how? Hmm? Ah, oh, okay, that story. <laughs> yeah, uh, once, um, not once, because my father t told good stories he, he really liked to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and one of his story was uh, how he made it to the Bauhaus. Um, and he, he was like um, in his... Um, he was like 20 or something, really, really young, and he heard about that school, uh, but didn't have really like access to this kind of, of art. And um, uh, he, he was not like in a bohemian uh, surrounded scene. So um, he wanted, but he, he, he realized that this is the school he wanted to go. And um, then he asked what, and, and he looked at books, and he had to send drawings. And he made a drawing of a square moon, and sent <laughs> this drawing of the square moon, and they immediately said, oh, yeah, this is, <laughs> he was, <laughs> so in a very clever way, like, a, it's more like a teenager tries to sneak out, and just, a, and they were just so flattered that somebody is making a square moon, that uh, he had his ticket to go to the Bauhaus. <laughs> I have one more question, actually. One thing which also is, is interesting is that um, in the wonderful text you wrote for Tate magazine, um, actually, um, this text uh, actually called uh, Peter Fishley on the Bauhaus, um, you kind of uh, end with talking about your father being quite open uh, and somehow walking a tightrope between his early teachers, Alvars and Clay, and a sort of a curiosity he had for many things. And you said he admired even Picabia. Um, and uh, uh, so it was not only rigorous, it had a sort of a playful and poetic side. And that sort of connection to Picabia, uh, I thought, was very interesting because you obviously, uh, you talk a lot about Picabia and you're very involved in Suzanne Paget's Picabia show. So I was curious about Picabia. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what can I say about that? Um, 
I think um, his eyes was open for Picabia uh, because he was a big fan of Kurt Schwitters, which for me, I think Schwitters is really one of the big key figures in, in, uh, in art of the 20th century. Super important. And by, under by understanding Schwitters, uh, I think for him it was uh, a kind, it was possible to go uh, um, uh, to Picabia. And Picabia was a very smart artist because he made this canvas in Fallen. Uh, nice. Yeah, he made like traps for many people, and one of, of the traps he built up was the, the machine paintings. <laughs> And for sure, my father was entering through that door in the in the oeuvre of uh, of Picabia, and um, uh, I think that that was the, and and then he just was open to an artist that um, liked to do things um, to build up and then suddenly make it the other way around. So, not to take any further questions, is that right? Or you would like to take okay. some more questions? Mm, it's okay. Let's take some more questions. <laughs> and can we take questions from the audience? Yeah, if there is a yeah. one or two. One or two. <laughs> is there one or two questions? No questions left. <coughs> no, I can't see any hands. So, Peter, huge thanks. Oh, there's one. Ah, oh, great, good, yeah. Um, Peter, I wanted to ask um, what your father thought about pop art and how did he approach it from the neo Dada side from the early 60s, coming from like a French perspective perhaps? Or, mm -hmm. you know, was he open to the more kind of commercial American pop? Uh, no, I think uh, that was difficult for him, for uh, pop art. Um, he, he was... Uh, he really liked Duchamp and this kind of uh, pre-conceptual things. But with Pop, uh, he had certain uh, um, struggles. And I remember uh, also that I, when, when I was um, a, a young teenager and was for the first time confronted with Pop art, because we, we don't have to forget that these times were highly politically charged. And um, so I remember a discussion. We went to see a pop art show with a friend of mine. And then we looked at each other. But, but this is critical. But this is critical. <laughs> we couldn't take it really like something uh, that uh, it's admiration for consuming. We, we only could uh, um, have like see something uh, that uh, it, it is a very, very critical. We thought in the beginning that pop art is a very critical attitude against consumism. So, um, but, but then more and more you enter it and um, uh, I, for me, the, the key point why I start to love pop art, I think it was Warhol's statement that everything is beautiful. And I remember, I mean, we were teenagers. When, when, <laughs> and I remember that um, with, with a friend of mine who was also very interested in art, we said, OK, let's make the test. Let's go outside and look at everything and try if we can see it in a beautiful way. And we did that and it's, yeah, yeah, you can see things. Everything is beautiful. <laughs> so that was uh, in a, a kind of way how I entered pop. But um, for my father, um, 
it, this, was, this was not possible. I mean, for him, it was easy to accept minimal art, but pop was um, uh, hard to... Uh, and also, like uh, postmodern architects, he couldn't really... Uh, I remember uh, we talked about like Aldo Rossi. Aldo Rossi was um, a very important figure in Switzerland uh, because Switzerland, the ETH, the Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule, was very um, uh, form follows function, dogma oriented. And in the 70s, Rossi came, and Rossi was. Um, Rossi was a similar figure to Venturi, but just talk, uh, uh, using other tools, he went more back to, he didn't went to, he, uh, Rossi didn't went to Vegas. Rossi was more somebody that went to Pisa and <laughs> places like this and took things from history. So, um, for him, this was, um, he was a completely a modernist. You know, he, he wanted, he wanted look forward and, and uh, this looking backwards and also looking at the, at the trivial was not possible because the, their intention was to make the world better. And by looking at the, at the shitty gasoline station, there was, this was not the solution. Um, do you have any thoughts on um, the trend uh, towards reskilling in, in art or sculpture, or maybe um, about the, the idea of technique? I don't get the question. Um, the fact that uh, artists are often um, involved with making things more these days. Do you see yourself as part of, part of that trend? Yeah, by hand, yeah. Um, yeah, I like to do things with my hands. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, that's true, but um, it's... It, I think it's, it's not coming out of um, uh, a strategy or something. It's just, um, I, I think it's, it's very nice when as an artist you can do something and you can do it today, you can do it with not a lot of money and uh, this is, uh, it's kind of like this arte povera attitude that you can work with simple materials. You can do it alone, you don't need. Uh, so it's just like the, the possibility of, uh, as Martin Kippenberger said, heute denken, morgen fertig. Uh, today thinking, tomorrow it's finished. You know, it's like this, this kind of, of very spontaneous, uh, just do it uh, thing like uh, even there is even like a, a punk mentality in it you know that uh, just when, when you want to play music just do it without taking hundreds of lessons and then it's, it's more this kind of attitude But I like a lot of, I mean, a lot of my favorite artists are uh, never touching their works. It's not <laughs> that I think it's a credo. Um. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if there is a relation, in, especially when you work with uh, objects, everyday objects, with um, either the tradition of the ready-made but of Duchamp's ready-made, but mm -hmm. also with the surrealist object. Is there anything in your work that is somehow relating to these traditions? The found object in surrealism and the ready-made of Duchamp. 
I think as an artist, you always work in, in a line of, of, uh, of um, other artists and other artworks. And uh, I would go that far that the first audience that when you, as an artist, when you do an artist, you speak to other artworks. I think this is the first, it's, uh, uh, maybe it's a little bit sad, artworks should speak first to people, but uh, the intention, how you start, it's, it's really the artwork speaks a lot to other artworks. And so, um, but it's always, it's, it's, uh, um, then when, when you're just not repeating something and it's, it, this is not, you can't repeat the gesture of the, of the ready-made. It's super boring and, uh, and also um, I'm very skeptical about the idea of the ready-made. I think it was, uh, this was a solution for Duchamp uh, an artist that realized when he was young that Duchamp realized that he's a mediocre artist. In his, when you look at his early work, it's obvious. So he had to come, but he was a, a very genius thinker. And uh, so he had to come up with an idea to sneak out of the problem because he, he didn't want it. So the uh, the idea of the um, of the ready-made is such it's uh, like it's such an idea of the end game it's really somebody that wants to bring art to an end because it's it's very it's very hard then to do something after that and uh, Duchamp did this in a very genius way, but in, in a way it's, it's, not, it's only valid for him. And uh, it's, not really, it's, it's not really leading somewhere. I mean, it's leading somewhere when, when you say, okay, there was, there was the, uh, the ready-made, but uh, it's good now to break this dogma. And also Duchamp himself breaks that dogma, which, which then on the other side makes him a, a, a very interesting artist, you know, that he, he, in a way, he realized he tried to play uh, uh, and do nothing, but then in the end he made kind of a Baroque work. So, um, uh, now I lost myself. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, in, in our case, I think the, the, like the objects that we, the, the, these carved objects, uh, they are like, they are the contrary of a ready-made because the, the ready-made is something, everything that is a ready-made can go back to real life. And, uh, and you can use these things uh, in, in the everyday life, uh, but by doing these um, objects that we do, we we taking something that is useful and make this form out of it. But we turn useful things in not useful things. The only thing that you can use our uh, carved objects is to look at them. This is, or to think about them, and uh, so it's it's really something else than the than the ready-made. Okay. I think. <laughs> <laughs>